You are listening to the Good Girl Podcast, Good Girl Podcast, where we are redefining what it means to be good through uncomfortable truths. I call those uncomfortable truths, confessions. So every week we have someone on sharing a confession. The goal is to heal, to set free, and to allow people to walk in their authenticity. Um, my name is Cameo King. I am the host. And guys, this week, this week has been a, a, a rough week for a lot of us. So I want to encourage us. I want to continue to remind us. And I don't say this lightly, but I want you to hear me when I say this. Mind your business. And when I say business, think about what you are called to do. Think about what makes you a happy, whole, healthy individual. Mentally, spiritually, emotionally, all these things. Sometimes you may just have to shut stuff down so you are secure, so you are happy, healthy, and whole, right? And so I just want to remind us when we are experiencing trauma after trauma after trauma, and we are forced to digest some of this stuff, right? It's okay to shut it down. So I just want to remind y'all of that and to give yourself permission to do that. So this week, excited um, about this topic. Uh, I hope you guys are joining us with an open ear. Um, I'm excited to bring this guest on. We've actually known each other for a while. We go back. <laughs> we go back. So I'm going to go ahead and bring her on in, bringing in Erica Williams. Hey, girl. Hey. hey. <laughs> <laughs> it is so good to be here. Thank it's you so, to be here. It's so good to have you. Me and Erica go back, what, 10, 10? 15 years? Yes, yes. At least it's, I know at least 10. Yes. Yeah, because we worked we worked in radio at the same at the same station at the same time. Um, and I met Erica, your loving, bubbly, passionate spirit, even even there. You're a, a little bit, a little bit intimidating, but uh, but the, the love covered it all just a little bit. I said, Whoa, I think the first time I met you, you just I think it was one day like I wasn't feeling good or something, and you just you were you was just going, like you just started preaching and pouring. I said, Okay. I'm <laughs> awkward <laughs> but it was it was all yeah. good because i needed it and um you have such an encouraging spirit so um Bless you. erica excited to have you on um just a little bit just a tiny bit about erica erica I i'll say reverend reverend erica williams she is a faith leader organizer and international human rights activist and community leader she is currently serving as an organizer for the poor people's campaign a national call for moral revival she is at also the founding pastor of set it off Outreach Ministries. I'm excited about that. Set it up <laughs> on, on it so off. many levels. On yes. so many levels. Um, and so excited to have you and excited for what you're going to share. But before we get into that, I do this with all my guests. So I hope you're ready, Erica, to bring us into the present moment. I ask my guests to sing, rap. Uh, I kind of want to throw in ukulele, beat, drum, whatever you do. Yes. You got to give us a song to bring us in the moment. And I'm going to give you a five second countdown. Okay. Are you ready? I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm okay. 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 Five, four, three, two, one. Woke up this morning. Mm. Sunrise on my face. Three little birds against my window singing this song. Something, something. <laughs> this is you? my message to you. Ooh, ooh. This is Bob Marley. Don't oh. you worry hey, oh, yes. about a thing. Yes. Because every little thing is going to be all right. Yes. yes. Don't you worry, worry. Uh. about a thing. Hey, hey, cause every, every little, little thing, thing gonna be all right. Girl, yes. I think yes. that first part. Yes. It wasn't all right there, but we came on back. <laughs> we did, cause it's so funny. I was like, okay, I'm gonna catch this. I promise you I'm gonna catch this. I'm Girl, I couldn't catch it, but that's all right. We caught it at the end. Hallelujah, we did. somebody. We did. We did. I thought we about a couple it. a couple different songs. Listen, at first I said, is this Erica by Duke? No, it's not. Nope. It's not. It's by Molly, baby. It's not. It's not. Well, thank you for that. Worry. We can. About a thing. Every little thing going to be all right. So I'm excited to have you. And so let's hop right into um, this conversation, Erica. And so we, <laughs> we talked earlier. Yes. And it's so funny. When you when I first asked you to come on the show, I was like, and I, and I saw your confession. I said, it's not, not, not 
Erica. I know you had so much fire in you. Why did you give me that confession? But then we had a conversation about yes. what we're going to talk about today. And so um, for me and for you, it's really about how you came to terms with the teachings in the church that did not serve you as a Black queer woman. Um, and I'm, I'm excited about this conversation. Yeah, me too. I'm ext I'm extremely excited because I just I think this is the time. My ancestors are calling for us to be be healed and to be free. And it's time out for us to stop living in in these closets and living, you know what I mean, ashamed of who we are and coming to our full authentic selves. Like it's time. It's past time. So, I'm yeah. grateful for this conversation because it's time for us to get free. Hey. Yeah. That's what free. it's about. That's what it's about. And so um, I, I feel like that's a that's a that's a big question. Yes. You know, how did you come to terms with it? So was there one instance? Was there an entry level to um, to that process of coming to terms with, you know, you being first a queer black woman in the church? Because I think that in and of itself is a path. And then also understanding that some things that people who loved you, people who poured into you, people who wanted to give you their best simply taught you wrong or taught you in ways that were very harmful to who you who you would become. So I, I want you to start where you think it's appropriate in this conversation. Well, yeah. And so, Camille One, just thank you for this amazing podcast. I'm grateful because this is, I know, the work of the spirit and the ancestors because it is the design of the spirit for us to be free, not for us to be living in religious dogma. So thank you for opening this space uh, for us to have voice to to the things that I know it needs to be talked about. And so, you know, I, you know, grew up in the Baptist church. I grew up in <laughs> True Vine Missionary Baptist Church. And, you know, all my life I was just taught, you know, this purity mindset said like no sex before marriage and you know god made uh adam and you know uh eve and adam and eve not Eve, you know adam and steve all these different conversations and things that people often talked about but even growing up you know i knew there were like folks in my congregation i had an aunt who i knew you know her and a woman lived together and folks made it like oh they're best friends yeah they best friends and they doing something else too but we didn't talk about those things because in the church it was like you had to be you know heterosexual you know, you know, cisgendered, you had to be, you know, this certain type of marriage, like that was what was on display in love relationships. And so anyways, I remember being young, like, you know, just having, you know, like feelings for like some of, you know, like some of my girlfriends who, you know, like we were close, we were, you know, friends and shared things. But of course, being taught in church, like this is not what you can do, you know, like you have to be this certain way. And, and, and so what I come to understand is because I went to seminary in 2013 at Howard University, School of hey, you do. <laughs> um, and, and so I had a class called Sexuality in the Black Church, and there was a book called Sexuality in the Black Church. Um, get this book, y'all. It's going to set you free, baby. It's going to snatch your edges and put them back on for you. <laughs> um, and, and it's a really great book, but she, you know, Kelly Brown Tuckless talks. Kelly Brown Douglas talks about in this book, you know, like a lot of folks are living on, you know, inauthentic lives. And I mean, she even brings in data, like at a lot of these conventions, you know what I mean? Church conventions, like the highest rate of pornography, you know, was, you know, people would say gay or lesbian, you know, pornography. So you got these bishops and preachers and teachers and leaders and evangelists watching porn and doing all this other stuff because they're hiding actually what they feel. And so that class, you know, just really opened up my eyes for me. Like, look, like I, you know, have read the scriptures and there was nowhere that I saw in there that said that this was how it is. And what I come to understand is, and I am grateful for, you know, my time in seminary because it allowed me to see, we have been taught the slave religion. We were given mm -hmm. the white master slave religion. We were given the theology of Augustine, of Hippo, these folks who said to deny your body and, you know, you know, do all these things like your body is a sin, you know, and all these things. And like, you have to beat the flesh and, you know, like just telling us all these things that we shouldn't do to our bodies and how we shouldn't take care of them and love them and be free to love who we love. And so, I, you know, I came to understand through my ancestral lineage and throughout the teachings you know what I mean? Of black folks, like that wasn't true. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like it was really all of the things that we were taught as black people to keep us docile, to keep us, you know what I mean? Oppressed and depressed. And so Cameo, I mean, it's a lot more to it, but I think I just began to allow myself to be 
opened up to understand what I had been taught was what my ancestors had been taught because slave masters wanted to control us. Yeah. And I, and it's, it's a lot of things you said, but I want to be clear and make some distinctions. And I also want to highlight some things. One, you talk about authenticity. I don't yeah. think that's something we hear a lot in our faith spaces about the importance of being who we're called to be and what authenticity looks like versus what, you know, respectability politics looks like yes. versus what is acceptable by society standards. We don't, we don't talk about that a lot. We talk about obedience and following the rules. And obviously, in my humble opinion, that is, as with everything, points back to slavery because yes. those things protected us um, and protected us in the physical sense, not necessarily in the spiritual sense or even in the emotional sense, but they protected us and they kept us alive, alive to stay in line, which points back to what you said. So that was one point. So I want you to come back around to the importance of authenticity and how that actually aligns with our calling and how that actually actually um, connects us to God and the power of God and who God has called us to be and walk in this earth. So that's one yes. point. And then, the, and then the other point, and I'll remind you of these, but this, I'm just going off the top of my head. <laughs> uh, the other point is when you talk about, because <clears throat> I want to make this clear. So when you talk about the slave master's religion, right? I want to make a distinction that the slave master's religion is a i'll call it a a sect like it is not christianity so christianity is White not supremacy oh, thank you thank you thank you just make that clarity because i don't know if by and large we understand it because i think a lot of times when we hear christianity all we hear is what we know which is the western understanding of christianity so to make the distinction right and even some up uh, even some things that we've been taught in western christianity um like they're they're wrong and <laughs> they oppose yes. the Bible, right? Yes. Um, and if you take a look deeper, or even if you or if, or even if you go further back, right? Um, so so just making those two those two different distinctions. Mm -hmm. um, so that was one, and that was two, and I'm just gonna stop there so we can <laughs> so we can address those two, um, and then and then we'll continue on in this conversation. So authenticity, authenticity. Yes. So if you could talk about that and how that wrapped in with their journey. Yeah, well, I mean, I just think so many of us, I mean, we don't even know what it's like to re to, to live a real authentic life because so many of us are trying to be, uh, we are trying to be accepted and, and appreciated by white, by white culture. I mean, like I hate to say it, but so many of us black folks have started to embody the actual white supremacy in which we often talk about um, because we want to be seen as a certain way. You know what I mean? We want to have prestige. We want to, to have the wealth. We want to be a certain way. We want to, you know, be accepted by the mainstream culture, which we will never be accepted. Let's be real clear. Like they will never accept us. I don't care if you, you, whatever you do at the end of the day, we are still people from the Afri African descent. And at the end of the day, we have to follow the path that our ancestors followed. And be real honest with you, Cameo, a lot of our ancestors were not Christians. Like, mm -hmm. I think we need to really understand that, like, a lot of our ancestors had the African spirituality. They were the Yoruba, the Ifa, you know, traditions. Um, they were Muslims. Like, and so when a lot of them came to, to the Americas, they became Christians. And real clear, let's be real clear, when our ancestors received the Bible, they received a Bible that did not have the book of Exodus in it because mm -hmm. they did not want us to know the story of people like setting themselves free, like being liberated. And so we were giving all these things to, like you said, keep us oppressed, make us want to be like white folks and make us want to be accepted. And at the end of the day, that's what stripped a lot of us from being authentic to who and what God created and called us to be. Some of our people kept on, you know what I mean? Bringing the traditions that they brought from, from, from the, you know, from Africa, like, because you still have hoodoo in this country. I think folks should look up hoodoo and look up voodoo. That is not witchcraft. That is yeah. not the devil. White supremacy told folks that that was that. And that's when we started shunning that. But actually, that was the thing that our ancestors had to get them to freedom, to help set them free. And even in a lot of our churches, let's be real clear, a lot of the things we do in our churches is voodoo, if you want to call it, or hoodoo. What y'all think ancestors is? When Jesus went on the Mount of Transfiguration, uh, right before he was crucified, and Elijah and Moses came, what what do you think the ancestors came to strengthen him? And and even I think about Erica, how many how many of the um, Bible verses how they reference 
God. Ancestors. It's like the God of this person, the God of this person, the God of this person. And they'll go back through the lineage yes. and talk about the God of this person. So they're not denying <laughs> no. from whence they came. That was deep in Jewish tradition. And I mean, like, I think in a lot of our traditions, I mean, <laughs> Let me tell you, when you go into some of these white establishments, girl, you can go in these places and you see pictures up of, of these white folks, their ancestors who had our ancestors enslaved and so many other things. But we as black folks, they came over and told us we can't honor our ancestors. We can't do all this stuff because it's witchcraft and it's voodoo. And it has stripped us. They brought us to this strange land and took all of the things from us. Well, well some of our ancestors did, because some people still hold on to it, but they stripped us and made us really be conform to the ways of white supremacy and, 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 and colonialism. And so that is why I am grateful. Uh, going back to what you asked me, um, even about, you know, with Christ, I think the second point, what did you say about with Christ? Um, Oh, making the distinction between Western Christianity yes. and and the I'll say the real Christianity, like the, the, the real, real Jesus, the black Jesus, the black <laughs> Jesus, Yeshua, the African Messiah, who was yeah. a brown skinned Palestinian Jew. Let's be real clear. And like at the end of the day, like we have been taught, like Jesus was this passive, docile person. He wasn't. Jesus would be not even accepted by most of the Christian churches today because he was poor. He was a low wage worker. He was somebody who society cast aside. But we, you know, like we have a saying in the in the National Union of the Homeless, we'll say we'll serve a, 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 a homeless man on Sunday, which means we'll serve Christ. But then we'll walk past one on Monday. Because at the end of the day, we have conformed to this white supremacist notion of Christianity of like one, even this prosperity gospel to a lot of ways have brought us into understanding. Like if you don't have wealth, then you ain't got enough faith. You ain't done enough things right. And that is not the truth. That is not it. And, and, and the sexuality piece is so much a part of that. We are so bound, Cameo. And I'm sorry. I, I, I My heart really hurts because I really mm -hmm. wish I would have had this teaching a long time ago. And I yeah. wish these other things my grandmother and other women would have been able to have but it's okay because i'm thankful to god for good girl podcasts and so many other movements and things that are hoping to bring us into the light of that mm -hmm. we were not created to be you know dependent upon you know what i mean like like this dogma in religion we were to be free okay. we were to be in our divine being our bodies are sacred our bodies are beautiful and they are to be loved and to be nurtured by whomever we choose yeah, I so it's something that you said to Erica, and then we'll get we'll get to your 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 three teachings you had to <laughs> unlearn. Yeah. Uh, but I, I want to go with the flow of the conversation. But when you talk about especially like the prosperity gospel, and then something where the whether we say it intentionally or unintentionally, or it's explicit or expli or implicit, but it's this idea very much so that because you are not. Um, and let's not even say wealthy because you are not where you're supposed to be. That means you aren't doing something right by God, right? Or that because you haven't uh, so much money in your bank or because you aren't blessed by Western standards that you are not walking in step with God. And I, I found that to be hugely problematic and how that is very much tied into capitalism. And I even read a book, girl, I was like, I, and somebody recommended it. I was like, it's a really good book. It really, it's supposed to, you know, break down what we're really supposed to be doing in terms of, you know, the gospel and it really refocuses us. And, it, and she said it changed her life. I said, okay, well, let me read this book. Girl, I wanted to throw the book across the room because the examples that they were giving in their foundation of what it meant to be blessed was very much based on material items. Like this gave an example of this woman who went to another country and she said she looked down on the people uh, because of the life they were living and like, how could you possibly conceive a child in a space like I, I said, woman, like what, what? So you're telling me God isn't present in here? Are you like, are you, are you telling me that because you have, and let's, and let's be clear, I don't want to deny neither the blessing it is to have or what I feel like, because I because I know I have a certain perspective, but to have running water, right? Yes. To have a safe space, to have a vehicle to live in America. But there's like there's a flip side to it, right? Yes. There's a difference between 
um, you come to know God in a different way and you become rich in other places. You become rich in love. You become rich in grace. You become ri- like you become rich in all these things. And you got some of us over here thinking we live in life and baby, you poor. Like you're, you're poor, poor in spirit. Yes, yes. Because yes. if those things were taken away from you tomorrow, you're telling me then that God isn't good? Yes. That's exactly it. Kevin, and the thing is, people use the scripture, the scripture that says that the poor will be with you always. But the reason why the, that Jesus said that in the Bible is because he said what, what it talks about in Deuteronomy 15. The reason why the poor will be with you always because you won't pay them what they're worth. You won't do the workers right. Like right now, we got to fight for the $15 minimum wage. Why the hell we fight for $15 when people <laughs> need to be able to take care of themselves and be able to eat? You see what I'm saying? So the reason why Jesus was saying all these things is because he know us. He knew that we would be greedy. We would have greed and capitalism and all these things. It was present in his time. Because I want to be very clear. I want folks to hear me and hear me loud and clear. Jesus, when he stepped on the scene, he gave his message very clear on what he came to do. He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me for he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, to the house of Bethany, those who have been made poor by society, the protocols. He said, to heal the brokenhearted, to set the captive free, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Or now, which meant the jubilee, which meant the canceling of debt. That's what they talk about in Deuteronomy 15. And so Jesus basically was saying, this is what I came here to do. I came to go against the Roman Empire to tell them to set people free, to break them from all the, 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 the poverty, from the, you know, the sexism, from all of the isms that were keeping people oppressed them out. Mm-hmm. That's why Jesus came on the scene. It wasn't about who the hell somebody was sleeping with and doing none of that. That ain't what you read in the Gospels. It was always about if you love me take care of the poor if you love me take care of the orphan if you love me take care of the widow it was always about taking care of people and loving your neighbor as yourself and so we got all this bull shrinking wrong now because we think you got a little mercedes you think you got a little 745 you think you got a nice little house that you are riding with jesus let me just let you clearly understand and know jesus was with the poor he walked among those who society had outcasted, who had mm-hmm. said that they were lepers and all the other things. That's who Jesus hung out with. That's who Jesus came for. And so at the end of the day, he always challenged the religious leaders and those, those who had wealth or those of the day like, why don't you take care of other people? See, it's nothing wrong with you having the money, but how do you help other people? See, that's my thing. We live in the richest country in the world. You hear me? Two of the richest people in the world, Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates, live right in Seattle, Washington, where I am right now, baby. They got money. You hear me with that song that man been talking about, where the money reside? Where the, where money, the money reside? reside. <laughs> Honey, the money reside right here in Seattle. You hear me? But when you go up and down the street, you see RVs with people living in them. You see mm. cars with people living in them. You see tents all over with this city with people living in it and so that is where the problem is and that's what Christ would be addressing because it's not about you having but it's not just you having it's making sure everybody has because there's enough to go around but because of capitalism it would always be those who have and those who have not and that is the call the cause of Christ is to make sure that everybody has something to make sure everybody got a house to make sure everybody got food to make sure everybody got running water and cameo let's be real clear in Michigan right now it has been seven years since I can folks in Flint, Michigan have had clean water. You hear me? They still drinking bottled water because it wasn't the fact that we didn't have enough water. Hell, we live around the Great Lakes. It was the simple Listen. fact that the greed of the state of Michigan allowed for them to take the water from the Detroit River and put it to the Flint River. And the General Motors plant there in Flint wouldn't even use it because it was rusting the parts on the cars. They wouldn't use it, but you thought that you could give it to people in Flint because they were poor. of the people in Flint were poor. And that's why you gave them that leaded water. So it's all about the fact that we got capitalism, white supremacy that rules this nation, Christian Mm. nationalism. And that is what a lot of us black folks are upholding. And we got to get real clear. That ain't what our ancestors, that ain't what they were with. That's not what they were with. Because churches were started as hush harbors, indivisible institutions to set us free from the demonic fields of capitalism. I want to bring us back because I feel like Erica, you and I could go and we could talk on this topic <laughs> for a lot. But I want to talk about specifically about, you know, your story. And I want you to highlight uh, three teachings that did not serve you as a black queer woman. Um, and, and keep in mind that I, I think this ask could be a hard ask for you. Right, because and maybe it's not. Maybe like, can't me know if I'm good. I'm about, I'm about to tell you what it is. But <laughs> I think about, you know, the dynamics of the black church. 
right? I think about the mothers. I think about the ministerial leadership and how, for the most part, that they would do what they could and that they were giving us what they would work for them or what they thought was working for them or what someone else told was working for them. And so they were giving that to us with this idea that I am loving on you. I'm trying to give you, I'm trying to give you the tools to succeed. And so then we're at this crossroad where we realize that's not working for me yep. or that's not right. That, that doesn't apply to my life or you steered me in the wrong direction, or that was extremely hurtful and harmful to the life I live. And so understanding those dynamics, when it's someone who sincerely loves you um, for the most part, and who is trying to give you everything they have for you to succeed, and they feel that in their soul, but you're like, mm -hmm. no ma'am, yeah. no sir. Yeah, I mean, there's so many things. And so one thing in particular um, is that love is love. Um, and I think I say that in the context of we have failed to remember that God is love and every person that is created in this world was created in the Amal Dia, which is the image of God. And so, you know, I hate when people often say, you know, hate the sin and love the sinner, but hate the sin. Um, you can't do that because at the end of the day, God is a God of love and love is love. And so at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if you're getting love from you know, a, a, another person of another gender, whatever, that is still the embodiment of God and love. And so, you know, I just think so many of our people in our churches have been stripped, you know what I mean, of really loving relationships. I remember the movie Women on Brewster Place. Um, that was one of my favorite movies growing up. And there were two black women, you remember, who were in a relationship there and people tried to shun them. And like one of the mothers, she was like, they going to hell. They over there lapping up with women. But my thing was like, that mother was so evil. She was so bound. She had so much hatred. And I was like, the sad part about it was that she never, I don't know if ever really received the love that she deserved and could have had because she didn't recognize that love was love and God is love. And so love in that regard can come from any person because we're all made in the image of God. So that would be one of the things that I, I had to come into the understanding of because I was shutting people out. There were people who tried to love on me, but I was like, oh, they gay. I remember like, I couldn't even, I can't hang around them because they're gay or they this, mm -hmm. or I had a friend who was bisexual, who was that. Like, that's some stupid shit now that I look back on it. Like, and I called myself a Christian. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like at the end of the day, like I was like, oh, I love God. But then I was shunning people and not allowing people to be who they were. So, so I had to unlearn, like love means that people are able to be who they are and I accept them because they are made in the likeness and the image of God. And I know that's hard for a lot of us to remember and to think about, but we all were made in the likeness of God. Am I correct? That's what the scripture says. Yeah, so how yeah. can you tell a person that they're wrong when they're living their authentic truth? Yeah. And I think I, I think about a lot of things. So those those statements, that statement makes me think about a lot, um, you know does does it matter or how much does it matter um the conduit by which something comes That's and when right. i say that if i need some type of medicine doesn't matter if it comes in a cup doesn't matter if it comes in somebody's hand doesn't matter if it comes you know in the mail as long as I get that medicine so that I am it. healed. That's it. That's it. That's it just it. it just made it just made me think about it in a different way. And That's then it. even and even and then even applying a friend of mine, she challenged me. Um because I think too for those who are listening, this may be hard to digest, right? Uh, because you've been taught the opposite your whole life in a sense, and you don't even know it that love is also exclusion. Like that's what some people have been taught. They don't realize it, but they've been taught that um, where we hear it <laughs> and, we, and we hear it overtly in the church. You know, sometimes you just got to cut people off. Like, I, I I don't know how I feel about that statement. Like, um, that's the cancel culture. Yes. We live in so bad. I'm just saying, because Christ has never cut me off and I know I'm not Christ, no. but, but like, it's just, you may have to love somebody differently or set your boundaries and that's understandable. Yes. Um, so you can be healthy, but just cutting someone off, I don't, but, but that's but, not Christ. 
Yeah. And, and, and so I say all that to say is that what that to me speaks of is <laughs> opposite of, of, of a scripture and I'm paraphrasing, but when it talks about how it is easy to love someone who is like us, right? It is easy to like, what credit is given to you for you to love someone in a sense who has liked you or who has not harmed you. And I'm not saying, you know, you've been harmed by people, but then you're essentially saying that I can't love you because you're different. That's like, I, I, I can't love you because we don't think the same or because our outlook is it, 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 on the world is different or because our relationship with Christ is different or because what I accept about myself is different than what you accept about yourself. And, and to me, that goes against that wholeheartedly goes against, <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, the nature of Christ and, 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 and what Christ is here for. And, and like, we don't how even we, know Christ. Like, like how, and so, and, and the way my, so the way my friend put it, Erica, she said, I think if anything, love isn't necessarily loving someone who's like you. True love shows up when, you know, someone in a sense is different from you. When someone, you know, doesn't show up in the world, like, like you show up, like That's when right. it's in opposition. That's exactly correct. And that is the thing, I think, because we have gotten this docile, fake, you know what I mean, type of love. Like, we don't know actually who Christ is. I'm telling you, like, that's the thing. So many of our churches are open and we got the Father. Uh, we think we got God, but we don't have the Son and the Holy Spirit because we don't really fully know who Jesus is. Like, that's the thing I think was so sad about a lot of our churches is that we are teaching a gospel um, that is not the actual gospel of Christ, because if it was, it would include everybody. Christ came to bring people in, not to push anybody out. Mm -hmm never to push anybody out. That is never what you saw. He would rebuke and he would challenge, but it was always his ethos was love. His ethos was to bring people back into their wellness, into their wholeness, and to bring them back into their divinity and who and what God had created them to be. And his thing was to challenge the systems that were breaking people. That yeah. was the thing. And I'm telling you right now, as show as my name is Erica Nicole Williams, Christ would be challenging the church right now. That would be the first place to challenge because we have done so contradictory to what the gospel actually says. We push people away. We judge people. We we, we, we have done so much to hurt people. I mean, even this past month with Little Nas X, uh, with this story, Montero, you know what I mean? Call me by my name. Like we dogged this child, but this child was like, I've sat in some of y'all churches. And how y'all treated me. You get what I'm saying? Like, and at the end of the day, we like, oh, he going to hell. He doing all that. Hell, he been living in hell, sitting in some of y'all churches. But how you have treated people. And I'm telling you, I'm telling you, Cameo, I know that a lot of these churches, they don't want to hear this. But I'm telling you, you better get to know the real Jesus. Get to the, know the real Yeshua. Because the real Yeshua would not be the status quo that you see now. He would not be conforming to the white supremacy. Because a lot of our churches, we don't even know who we are. We don't know our mission because we've conformed to the world. And I and I think about um, so when you mentioned Lil Nas X and I and, and the role of the church, I think about how we're so very much we're quick to, to, to point. Look at you. Look at look at what you're doing wrong, right? But very rarely, if not, I don't I don't know the last time. I remember I was on this panel at a church, and I said I don't know the last time the church collectively has owned its sins, right? About how we've done people wrong, right? We are a body of people. So that means we are human and we error. And so, and we know we've grown, we've known we've, we've progressed, um, especially in certain denominations from red nail polish to, you know, wearing red lipstick. But have we co like collectively come together and say, this is where we messed up here, here, yes. here. And that's, yes. that's repentance. Like that's the first step, acknowledging, confessing your sins for where you fall short and then healing will come. Yes. But we, we don't even want to acknowledge. We haven't even, we haven't even got there. And so then also, so when I was thinking about Lil Nas X and I, I'm pointing back to authenticity, right? And how even, even God calls us to be authentic so God can meet us where we are, but we don't allow people to walk in their authenticity so God can meet folks where they are at. We don't allow yeah. that. It's like, first you need to dress up and do this and show up and perform like this. And then God will meet you. God is like, no. That's not God. 
that is not God cameo. And that's why a lot of us are broken. I'll be real honest with you until I stepped into my authentic path of following African spirituality of I sage, I, honey, I have me a therapist, honey. I have me my crystals, my Paulo Santo. I do a lot of different things because what mm-hmm. I come to recognize, God gives us tools to help mm-hmm. us get to our wholeness and our wellness. And until I started walking in that and understanding like a lot of the things I had been taught in church was not the truth and seeing so many people living in a space and don't have victory. Come on now, we shout about V-I-C-T-O-I-Y and most of us ain't got no V-I-C-T-O-I-Y. We are bound. We are broken. You see what I'm saying? But then you shun all of the things on the outside because that's the devil and it's Satan. It actually ain't. And that is where we have got to understand that Christ never came to judge in terms of Christ wouldn't be concerned about right now, Cameo, if if Little Nas X made that song and did the video, Christ would probably just be like, that's good. I like that you're creative. You tapped into your own authentic power to show your creativities and your gifts. And that's what's wrong with us. A lot of us in the church, we, we, we are so, so bound. We don't even know who and what God know. has created and called us to be. A lot of us are following standards of what we think we should be. And a lot of folks who are even in the role of being clergy, they heard the wrong P. They thought God called them to preach when God taught them to go pray. Mm-hmm. And get yourself healed and get yourself free. I, I think of this is how I think about it. <laughs> I think about if if we understand God to be who God is, like like yeah. like real talk. Like if if God is inexhaustible, yeah. inexplicable, and I am one person in one body during one time who was born in one city with one set of experiences, how dare I say that my experience is chief? Yeah. And that my experience leads and that you can only experience God through my lens. Like, like, That's right. like those words are limiting God. Like That's I it. can't even begin to fathom, right? Even, even if I get every single person's perspective yep. in this world yep. <laughs> on earth, right? We not, we not, we ain't even go past the galaxies, right? O- o- on this earth, <laughs> you know, I still wouldn't be able to comprehend the bigness of Of God. God. That's right. That's right. That's right. And that is the problem that we are trying to make ourselves comprehend and explain something that we we don't even have a minuscule. Like Mm -hmm. even a mustard seed, as the old church would say, of who God is, Cameo. And that is why I want us to open our minds and open our eyes to understand our ancestors. We love them and we thank God for the mothers of the church. We thank God uh, for the elders and those who came along and did the best that they could with what they had. But it is up for us to take the baton and to continue to run forward and to get more understanding and more knowledge of actually what it is. Does it mean to be a follower of Yeshua, a follower of of Christ, but want to just be a human in this world. And one yes. thing is true is we cannot push people away. If nothing else, this pandemic should have shown us that we need each other, that yeah. we need to be connected, that it doesn't matter. I didn't give a damn whoever gave me my vaccine shot, if they was queer, straight, lesbian, gay, whatever. Give me my vaccine. None of this stuff matters. Like you said, Cameo, if I need to go to the grocery store, I'm not asking the cashier, are you queer? Are you what? Because none of that matters. We have started majoring in the minor and minoring in the major things. And the major things are to love one another, to take care of one another, and to support one another. That is what I believe Christ is going to ask us on that day is how did you love your fellow man, your fellow human, excuse me. Yeah, But Erica, um, I thank you so much for this conversation. I thank you for your transparency. Um, I thank you for um, being bold. Um, And some people may not consider this bold, but I think when you compare the different spaces we've been in, like I just think the East Coast is progressive in some spaces. I think the Midwest, we we working through this. We ain't, I don't think we there yet. I don't think we there yet. Yes, um, yes. Um, and I know that's where a lot of your roots lie. You know, that's where you're yes. from. You're from Michigan, from Saginaw. That's right. And so, that's right. Um, so I, I appreciate you and I thank you for having this conversation. And and if you are listening, I, I, I just want to encourage you to just chew on it. Think about it. Go back to God. Ask yeah. God about it. Like, like and, and check your gut reaction too, right? That's right. That's because right. your gut reaction may not necessarily be God. I won't say your gut, but your the kind of visceral 
initial response. So not gut reaction, but that that initial kind of trigger response. That's it. And, and, and I would just leave folks with this. Like at the end mm -hmm. of the day, God created you in God's image. You are a masterpiece. You are beautiful. You are brilliant. And you are bold because you are not for what you do, but just for who you are. And so at the end of the day, I hope you really tap into who and what God has created and called you to be. I pray that the light turns on for you so that you can walk in your authenticity. Like it's time out. The world is tired. I'm tired of all these carbon copies of people. Like I, I love me some Cardi B. I love Meg the Stallion. I love all these beautiful people who are walking and who they have been called to be, but that ain't my story. I want to be Erica Williams and I want to live her to the fullest because what I do know, there will be some day that will come along. I won't be here anymore. And I want when the record is recorded that I was one who was the one who stood in my truth and in my power, who didn't affirm me and didn't care for me. I really don't give a damn, but I cared and I affirmed me and I stood bright in my light. Um, and so I just admonish all of us to live. Life is to be lived to the fullness. And that is God's will for all of us, not for some, but for all. And that is what I'm committed my life to do, to set it off in every space and place so everybody can be who God has created and called them to be. I love you. And I hope you heard today from my heart uh, because I know that it's God's will that you walk in divine healing and joy and peace and in and authenticity. All right. Thank you for listening to the Good Girl Podcast. Mm -hmm.